Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colorgraph. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're heading back to the early 16th century to examine a world on the cusp of huge and lasting change. We'll be talking about Martin Luther, Christopher Columbus, but most of all, the Ottoman Sultan, Selim I. We're used to thinking of the turn of the 16th century as a time of great change. In England, the Tudor dynasty was consolidating power. In Southern Europe, Ferdinand and Isabella had united the Kingdom of Spain and completed the Reconquista, while across the Atlantic, Christopher Columbus was redrawing the map of the world. Yet as today's guest, Alan McHale, explains, an important part of the picture is often overlooked in the Western scholarship of this time. In his new book, God's Shadow, he urges us to look further east across the Mediterranean to the Ottomans, who were making great territorial advances under Sultan Selim I. In his wonderfully erudite and entertaining new book, Mikhail shows how profoundly this Ottoman power and fear of Muslim domination coloured the lives, decisions and fates of most Europeans, from Martin Luther to the Spanish conquistadores. Alan Mikhail is Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History at Yale University. His new book centres on the life of Selim I and it's called God's Shadow, the Ottoman Sultan Who Shaped the Modern World. It's characterised by Stephen Greenblatt as an astonishing and thrilling story worthy of Game of Thrones. The other day, Alan took Violet Moller on a journey back through time to meet Salim in his prime and to tell us a little bit more about that very interesting year, 1517. I would like to thank you very much for joining us on Travels Through Time. I've really enjoyed your book. I thought it was extremely original and thought provoking. And I like the idea of sort of stepping back and looking at a familiar period of history from a slightly different perspective, which is very much what you you do. You look at some well-known historical events at the sort of end of the 15th century, the beginning of the 16th century, in relation to the Ottoman Empire, which is, as you point out, an aspect of history which is often missed out or glossed over by the sort of so-called Western, Western historians or Western viewpoint. And th- this seems to me to be part of, um, a, of a sort of a very general feeling at the moment with our history that we are all having to take a step back and reassess and look at things from a broader perspective and perhaps try and take off our cultural blinkers and there's been a few books published in recent years which um, attempt to do that obviously I'm thinking probably uh, the most famous is Peter Frankopan's um, The Silk Roads which very much refocuses attention in a different part of the world. And I just wondered how you came up with the idea of it um, for your book. It's quite a departure from your previous books, which were, I believe, mainly about the environment, the Ottoman Empire from an environmental perspective. Is that correct? That's right. Did you say that was right? That's right. So how did you get this idea? How, How did you come up with it? Well, you know, as as you've said, a lot of my earlier work was about the environmental history of the Ottoman Empire and specifically of Egypt's place in the Ottoman Empire. Egypt is conquered, as we'll get to um, in in our interview, by Selim in 1517. So there was this kind of point of origin story that I had always been interested in um, just kind of as backdrop of, uh, of my earlier work. So that's one answer. A, a more general answer, I think, and a better answer probably is that this moment, 1517, when Selim conquers the Mamluk Empire, is an enormous expansion of imperial territory. It has huge global ramifications, again, as we'll discuss. Um, and, and I didn't feel that we had a good sense of the place of that conquest in world history. And I wanted to offer that in the book. At the same time, if you read contemporary sources from the period, obviously from the Ottoman Empire, but European sources and, and things from the Safavid Empire, Russian sources, etc., 
that um, the Ottomans are, are always present. They are major, major players in the geopolitics of the era. So it seemed, um, as you were mentioning in the intro, it seemed a misalignment to, to understand that period of history without the Ottoman Empire. So again, I wanted to, to, to recover the Ottomans in that story. And how did you, um, because the, the Ottoman Empire is your area of specialization, and I wonder what brought you to, to that particular subject, you know, early on in your academic career? What, what made you interested in the Ottomans? Well, I was interested in Middle Eastern history more generally. Um, my family draws its its uh, lineage from Egypt, so I, I always had s- some sort of interest in the Middle East. When I became professionally interested in the history of the Middle East, you know, I, w- I was struck by the fact that the, the Ottomans ruled in the Arab world for over 300 years, and we didn't really understand uh, the impact of the Ottoman Empire on the Arab world. And so I wanted to I wanted to understand that better. And there are all kinds of reasons why we didn't, having to do with um, Arab nationalism and thinking that the Ottomans were, you know, foreign colonial powers um, and therefore were unimportant to understanding the history of the region and understanding how the, this empire of a very different cultural background, right? I mean, Ottoman culture is very different than Arab culture, is very different than Balkan culture, but how that overlay of Ottoman culture really impact all of these very different places for a very long time it is something that, you know, was really compelling to me. Well, one of the things I really loved were the um, the illustrations, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about them. I'm hoping that we'll be able to have some of them up on our website so that listeners can have a look themselves, but... There's some really beautiful images of Selim doing all sorts of things, you know, riding into battle and discussing um, things with his advisors. Um, and I wondered where, do they all come from one source or are they from many different sources? Can you just talk a bit about those? Right. So I, I was very lucky that my, my publisher allowed me to use a, a large number of black and white images and then also some color images. A lot of the images of Selim on campaign and in battle um, come from the Topkapa Palace. So this is the, the Ottoman palace where the sultans lived, right next to the Istanbul. Hagia Sophia Mosque and is a major tourist site. You know, any, any tourist who goes to, to Istanbul today, you know, you go to mm-hmm. the Topkapı Palace. It's a, a standard, uh, standard stop on the tourist trip. You can go to the harem. You can see the throne room. It overlooks the Bosphorus. It's obviously a very lovely spot. But it's, it's also a major collection for scholars. So its museum collections, its collection of objects is one of the largest in the Muslim world, partly because the, the Ottoman sultans were always receiving and giving gifts back and forth to different sovereigns. So there are all kinds of jewels and textiles and, and various things. And then it's also a major collection of, of manuscripts. Yeah. So one of the largest collections of manuscripts in, in the Islamic world. And so... I was lucky enough to be able to get many of the images from the book from the Topkapı Palace collection. Yeah, well, they're beautiful. They, they really are. So I just want to read a little quote, if you don't mind me quoting you back to yourself. This sentence struck me in your introduction, and I think this goes a long way to explaining the kind of uh, thesis of your book. Dozens of familiar figures, such as Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Montezuma, the reformer Luther, the warlord Tamerlane, and generations of popes, as well as millions of other greater and lesser historical personages, calibrated their actions and defined their very existence in reaction to the reach and grasp of Ottoman power. So that, I just think, is such a great starting point for talking about um, about your book and why it's so important. And of all the figures that you mentioned in that list, um, we're going to talk about Luther and Columbus a bit later. But I wondered if you could just give us a bit of background to prepare um, to prepare us before we go to your, your chosen year, to just talk about the geopolitical currents that underlay this whole situation um, with trade and the uh, Europeans' desire for discovering the new world and, and why that, how that was influenced by the Ottoman Empire. Sure. So the, the half century that the book really concentrates on is 1470 to 1520. 
that is Selim's life. He's born in 1470 and dies in 1520. Mm -hmm. It's also a period in which there are many world-changing events that we know quite well. And that list that you read out from the introduction involves some of those. So 1492, obviously, um, the Reformation, some scholars think the rise of, of commerce, an early form of capitalism, the foundation of uh, some states that are very much in one way or another with us today, including the Ottomans, the meaning of the new world for global history, all of that is happening in this period. So at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century, this is a moment where the Ottomans are really in the ascendancy in the Eastern Mediterranean. After 1453, with the conquest of Constantinople, that allows them really to cut off the Black Sea from European mercantile empires. It allows them to extend their control of the Eastern Mediterranean. It offers them a tighter grip on overland trade routes across Central Asia and to the Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean. This is along with the Mamluk Empire, which is still in power at the end of the 15th century. The Ottomans are also sending more and more of their forces further west in the Mediterranean at the end of the 15th century. So quite famously, in 1480, Selim's grandfather, Mehmed II, Mehmed the Conqueror, the conqueror of Constantinople, lands a fleet at Otranto on the very tip of the heel of the boot of Italy. And this is the first and only time that the Ottomans have territory on the Italian peninsula. They hold it for less than a year, but this is, this is a major event uh, for European powers. It strikes fear in their hearts that um, the Ottomans are soon going to be moving into the heart of Europe. Quite conveniently for European powers, Mehmed dies in 1481. And because of the succession battle, um, the forces are, are called back from Otranto. But this is symbolic of, of the push of the Ottomans west. So there's really a sense at the end of the 15th century that the Ottomans are, are no longer simply a regional power in the Middle East, but really, really pushing west in the Mediterranean. Yeah, coming for Europe, so to speak. Right, right. And just to pick you up on um, something that you mentioned then um, about the succession, this was, uh, for me, a very interesting aspect of, of your book. Can you please explain to us how succession in, I think, generally in the Muslim world, not just in the Ottoman Empire, but how it worked and how how important it was for for this period. Right. So generally up to up to this point in Ottoman history, there'll be some changes later, but generally it's the most favored son, which is generally the eldest son that succeeds the father, the Sultan. And usually this happens when the Sultan dies or is you know, physically incapacitated for some reason. Now, sons are produced in the Ottoman dynasty, obviously by the sultan and his concubines, not his legal wives. So Ottoman sultans had legal wives and they had concubines. For reasons that are not entirely clear, they chose to produce their male heirs from concubines. And the classical system in the Ottoman dynasty is known as one mother, one son. So once a concubine bore a son to the sultan, sexual relations ceased between the two of them, and mother and son's fortunes were then tied together so that concubine mothers had a vested interest in their sons, Ottoman princes, succeeding and hopefully one day taking over the throne. Being the mother of a sultan is a very privileged position, obviously. Now, these women are technically slaves. They were captured in battle often in the Balkans, sometimes in what is today the Ukraine and Russia, sometimes the Caucasus. It depended on the period and the battles going on, etc. So if we take Selim, for example, his mother, as best we know, was captured in Albania, brought to the Ottoman capital, Istanbul, in the harem, and eventually is taken to Amasya, where Selim is born, to his father, who is a still a prince at the time. So it's complicated, but 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 you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So can I ask one quick question? What yes. what happened to the sons who were born of the actual wives? Did they just they didn't ever get Yeah, they, they don't either. seem to to be a part of the of the battle for the for the throne in any real way. They are remarked upon but are never thought to be legitimate heirs of the sultan. 
it's not clear why. And it, it doesn't seem, I mean, if we just think sort of logically as to why that would be, it's not, it's not clear why. The system of, of producing errors from concubines makes sense in that one can produce a lot of errors quite quickly. And the Ottoman sultans did that. So Selim was one of 10 sons, for example, of different... And if we think of Henry VIII at yep. the same moment, yep. he's, he's desperately trying to right. produce one son, you know... Right, uh, right. It's a problem. In an early modern world in which there is disease and mothers and children die in childbirth and one can, you know, very easily be killed during a hunt and all kinds of things can happen to ensure the health of the of the dynastic line having as many possible successors as as one can is a good thing yeah the flip side of that though is that having many possible successors means that they might be eyeing the throne a bit early and we see that throughout ottoman history that the the princes of sultans are a threat to the sultan eventually and they then have to kill all their half brothers. Right. So, so generally, again, this will change in various periods. But generally, once a prince has taken over the throne, to um, ensure the safety of his possession of the throne, he will kill his half brothers. Yeah. And and Selim, for example, does that. He kills um, his rival half brothers. We should say though that it is a remarkable fact of Ottoman history that in over six hundred years of the dynasty, every sultan is the blood descendant of a single individual, Osman, the founder of the empire. Yeah, and I mean, you could say it's a way of you know ensuring the survival of the fittest because if if it's a sort of battle between your however many um, son illegitimate sons. The, the the most determined will probably win through. And that certainly seemed to be the case when it came to Selim. He seemed to be just much more determined and ambitious um, than his half-brothers. That's, that, that's absolutely right. And that was baked into the system, this kind of sense of survival of the fittest. It, it also points to the importance of the of their mothers, right? Because yeah, their, yeah. their mothers helped to position them in such a way as to be able to take over the throne. Especially when one thinks that one of the ways that sons prove themselves is by governing out in provinces once they, they reach a certain age. But they're very, very young when they become governors of provinces. So Salim is 17 when he becomes governor of a major city. And he goes there with his mother. So it's very clear. And we have orders written in her name, accounts of her meetings, etc. So it's very clear that that for large periods of Salim's life, and then, you know, by extension, all of these other princes, that their mothers are really the ones who are governing in the name of their sons to prove that their sons are worthy of taking over the, the throne and whatnot. And in various, you know, for in, in various situations, the mothers are more or less active in, in their in their son prince's lives. And and by extension, it's the mothers who are training the sons for rule. They're preparing them for for to be a ruler. Absolutely. For, that, that is the, the fundamental logic of the one mother, one son rule in Ottoman dynastic politics. Once a son is born to a mother, she becomes absolutely responsible for grooming him, educating him making him the best possible ruler he can be to hopefully one day take over the throne. Yeah. Okay, so Selim has um, gone through this process with his mother and um, been successful. And um, he's managed to not only take the Ottoman throne, he's then expanded the empire to into the east. He's, he's uh, defeated the Safavid empire. And the next thing he does is he looks south to the mighty Mamluk, um, empire, which is um, centered on Egypt, and the capital is Cairo. And this takes us to our first scene, which is um, Selim riding into Cairo in triumph, having defeated the Mamluks. Can you take us there and tell us um, what your chosen year is, please? Sure. I've chosen the year 1517, which, as, as you say, begins with Selim's conquest of the Mamluk Empire. So it's in January of 1517, after a six-month campaign from Anatolia through Aleppo, Damascus, Jerusalem, down the Middle East, um, that he eventually arrives at the Mamluk capital of Cairo in January 1517. And what kind of a state was the city in when he arrived? So uh, the Mamluk Empire had been in existence for over two centuries uh, because of this massive campaign of the Ottomans, all of 
the economic and military resources of the Mamluk Empire had been thrust to its east and north to be able to try to um, defend against the, the Ottoman invasion. The, the Mamluk Empire controlled all of that territory that I mentioned from Aleppo to the south. So that campaign of Salim's moving south is steadily um, chipping away at Mamluk authority so that by the time Salim arrives in Cairo, it's a city under siege. There are food shortages. There had been um, high levels of de- depopulation. You know, it's a, it's a city in, in dire straits. Right. And what happens to the leader, the Mamluk? Well, he's, he's the caliph, isn't he? Right. So there are several, there are several Mamluk leaders that Salim kills. The, the first one at a site just to the north of Aleppo, where he kills the, the sitting Mamluk leader after killing that ruler in August of 1516, actually, a new Mamluk ruler takes over. That person is eventually killed in Cairo and is actually strung up in a central location in the city to, you know, strike fear in the, in the heart of the populace and make clear that the Ottomans are, are, are now in charge in Cairo. You're right that the Mamluk Empire, because it rules from Egypt into the Arab world, including, importantly, Mecca and Medina, the Mamluk Sultan is also the Caliph. The Caliph technically is the ruler that possesses Mecca and Medina, the holy sites in Islam. And so... Defender of the faith. Yes, defender of the faith, defender of the two holy cities. So, you know, this gets to some of the importance of Salim's conquest of Cairo, that it's not just a territorial expansion. It more than doubles the size of the empire, the Ottoman Empire, bringing in territory in North Africa, Egypt, and then, um, you know, the Levant, and then Mecca and Medina, the, the Hejaz, the region known as the Hejaz in what is today Saudi Arabia. So, you know, the geographical expansion is obviously key, more than doubles the size of the empire. But, but the symbolic um, and the, the, um, the religious legitimation that comes from this conquest for the Ottomans is absolutely crucial to understanding this moment. Because suddenly Salem is the primary um, Muslim ruler on earth. So, right. So up until this point, the Ottomans are a Sunni empire. The sultans are, are Sunnis. The majority of the people who live in the territory of the Ottoman Empire are Christians. They're Orthodox Christians, the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. So in 1517 is the first time that the Ottoman Empire has a majority Muslim empire, the first time in its history. Yeah. It's the first time that an Ottoman sultan can legitimately claim to be the caliph of the world because he possesses now Mecca and Medina. It also brings cities like Jerusalem, Damascus, Cairo, which are enormous, uh, enormously important yeah. centers of Islamic learning. So this is the first time after the Ottomans had been in existence for over two centuries that they can legitimately claim to be the leaders of the Muslim world in that they rule over the largest Muslim empire in the world, and they possess these holy cities. And this must have sent shockwaves around the world, really, but especially in Europe, I would imagine. Absolutely. So, you know, as I was mentioning before, this kind of forward momentum of the Ottomans in the Mediterranean, this capture of the Mamluk Empire more than redoubles that sense of foreboding and and dread in European capitals. Because now they control the whole eastern coast of the Mediterranean and large proportion of the southern coast of the Mediterranean as well, right? With all the associated ports and trade routes and everything. Absolutely. That comes with so that. if we think in our mind's eye of, of a map of the Mediterranean and draw a line from from Algeria moving east along the coast and following the coast around, the Ottomans possess everything from Algeria up until very close to Venice. More than half of, of the Mediterranean coastline. The Ottomans come closest to replicating the territory of the Roman Empire. And they, they style themselves as, as new Romans. They use that, that terminology of Rum, which is Turkish for the Romans. For Romans, yeah. Yeah. Hello there, it's Peter. Imagine this, a picture of the four beetles that no one has ever seen before until this week. Given the enormous and enduring popularity of the Fab Four, I think that's quite a thing, but it's what we have for you today on Travels Through Time. I've been telling you in recent weeks about our partnership with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd. 
Well, he's colorized a picture of the four smiling beetles on the night of their very, very first American concert. It catches brilliant details as George and Ringo cigarettes. There's the flashlights of those 1960s cameras. There's this air of bedazzlement kind of written into their faces. And you can see that three out of four of them are wearing brand new coats, which is a sign of their new found wealth. You can check out this brand new image along with a full range of Jordan's work at colorgraph.co. That's colorgraph spelt the American way, C-O-L-O-R, colorgraph.co, where you can buy prints of Jordan's work on subjects from Mark Twain to, well, John Lennon now. They make unique and fabulous presents. So do check out colorgraph.co. I think that takes us quite neatly to our next scene, which is deep inside Europe. Can you can you take us there and tell us um, who are we witnessing and what are they doing? Right. So we are now still in 1517, obviously, in the town of Wittenberg, which is in Germany, the famous uh, location where Martin Luther promulgates his 95 theses. You know, as I argue in the book, Selim, the Ottomans, and uh, the Selim's conquests in 1517 is very important for understanding uh, the Reformation. And um, the way that I argue that is along the following lines. One is um, first by observing the fact that Martin Luther wrote a great deal about the Ottomans, the Turks, as he always calls them. Um, he was interested in various aspects of Ottoman history. There was a theological dimension. So he was interested in Islam. He uh, reportedly contemplated a German translation of the Quran, which never happened, but, but he was interested enough to, to, um, to think about undertaking that project. He was specifically interested in Islam in two things. It's anti-clericalism. So the fact that there wasn't an ecclesiastical hierarchy um, like the Catholic Church, there's no, there's no Muslim pope. Um, there's no council of bishops. There's no strict, strict hierarchical structure in Islam. He was also interested in the iconoclasm of Islam, that um, there are not generally human images uh, that are part of the worshiping of Islam, right? The, these, are, these are fundamental aspects of what will become Protestantism as we know it, that it's not ornate in the way that St. Saint, Saint Peter's Basilica was, which was a sign to Luther of the depravities, as he would say, of the Catholic Church, that it was interested in marble and gold for St. Peter's, that it was selling indulgences to make money off of the eternal lives of its poor adherents. Indulgences were the idea that, that one could pay a certain fixed sum. It, it was the case that there was a, a list of sins, uh, you know, I don't know, lying, lust, etc., and a price next to each one. And if you paid that price, you would be forgiven of those sins. And so for Luther, he saw this as something that wasn't based in scripture, wasn't based in the word of God, but was more of this world, a, a creation of the Catholic hierarchy for them to be able to make money. Right. So this is part of the reason that he advocates for a direct relationship between the individual and God, that it doesn't need the intercession of a priest or or of the church itself, an institution. And that's um, something else that, it, that, that was also a, a feature of, of Islam, wasn't it? That's right. And and we see this in his writing. Again, he if you go back to his sources, he writes a lot about the Ottoman Empire. It's also interesting for him that, you know, there's this theological aspect that I mentioned, but also the Ottoman serve as a very useful foil to the Catholic Church. So he, he's not an advocate for Islam in any kind of way. I don't want to, I, I don't want to make it out as though he was. For him, the, the sultan and Islam is, you know, incorrect belief. But the, the pope always comes out worse in the comparison between the Ottoman sultan and, and the Catholic Church. I like the quote, the pope kills the soul while the Turk can only destroy the body. Can you... Just elucidate that a bit. That that was something that um, that he wrote, wasn't it, Luther? It was right. So that that's that's very telling because the idea there is that you know the 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 body in Christian theology is is necessarily of this world is fleeting, right? The soul is what matters. It is the the eternal essence. So attacking the soul is always worse than attacking the body. 
because the Ottomans are, you know, outside of the Christian world and enemies, they can torture the body, they can capture you as a slave, they can break your bones. Um, but as long as your soul remains pure, you will receive everlasting life. Whereas the Pope, because he is the steward of the Christian soul, right? Yeah. If he is depraved, if he is able to chip away at the soul of the believer, that is the ultimate everlasting enemy of Christianity. So it's this idea that when one is on the inside of, of Christianity, inside of, of the Christian church, they are much more dangerous than the enemy that is outside, i.e. the Ottomans. Yeah. And isn't that, I mean, wasn't that also um, true of Islam? Uh, you know, the, the Sunni Shiite um, schism, which was very much um, a part of this period. It seems, it seems that often differences within a religion are, are worse than um, people who just follow a totally different religion. I, I don't know. Would you agree with that? No, I think that's absolutely right. So during Salim's life, and then after, of course, as well, the major enemies of, of Salim's Ottoman Empire are other Muslims. They are the Safavids yeah. and they are the Mamluks. Now, with the Safavids, the Safavids are mostly Shiite. The Mamluks are Sunni. Yeah. So I, I do think that Salim's conquests of these areas were mostly about politics, land, money. But of course, he uses the rhetoric of the divide between Sunnis and Shiites to great effect. Um, that they are heretics, yeah. that they have incorrect belief, that they are, um, you know, enemies in soul and on earth, all of that kind of stuff. So I think you're absolutely right that the kind of internal schisms are always, are always worse. I mean, it's yeah. very, it's a very peculiar aspect of religions, uh, I think. I mean, I'm not a religious person, so I, maybe that's why I find it hard to I sort of find it hard to understand how that could be the case. But I liked your description of, so the way that Luther kind of rationalised the whole thing was that the whole reason that Islam exist, existed or at that time was because the Christians were so sinful. So God was using Islam as some kind of a weapon against the Christians and that if only, you know, Christianity could sort itself out, the, the threat of Islam would just um, sort of melt away and disappear. And I, th I thought that was a very interesting, um, also slightly strange um, reading of the situation. Right. He refers to the Ottomans at one point as Christians' best helpers, uh, precisely for the reasons that, that you say that God has sent the Ottomans as Christianity's lash of iniquity. Um, that's, again, a quote from him to punish Christians for, again, their lustfulness, their, their desire yeah. for worldly riches, um, et cetera, something like indulgences. Um, and that only once Christians are able to overcome their sins in their soul, will they be able to overcome the worldly um, threat of the Ottomans. And was Luther unusual in his interest in the Ottomans and the amount that he wrote about them? Uh, well, well, yes and no. I mean, some of his ideas are are somewhat unique, but but all European powers were interested in the Ottomans, um, mostly for for military reasons. Um, so the popes, for example, wrote endlessly about the threat of the of the Ottomans. Um, Fifteen seventeen in the Vatican is a is a is a year of dread. After the announcement of Selim's conquest of the Mamluk Empire, there's an account that. Um, you know, lightning and thunder uh, were seen over the Vatican. Again, this sense of impending, ominous doom that the Ottomans um, represented. Mm -hmm. Even if we think of someone like Charles V, um, the, the ruler most responsible for the expansion of European territory outside of Europe in the Americas, he wrote far more about Islam and the Ottomans than he did about the New World. You know, if we think about Queen Elizabeth, she had um, very intense relationships with uh, North, the North African powers and also with with the Ottomans as well. I think all of this points to, to the idea, you know, one of the central ideas of my book, that the Ottomans were um, at the center of the world. They were major players um, in the geopolitics of the globe in this period. And therefore, we have to understand their place um, in this world. And again, if we go to the sources... If we go to Luther, if we go to Charles V, if we go to Elizabeth, we will see that they wrote copiously about the Ottomans. It, it, it's us, it's us historians, later historians, 
who, for our own reasons, maybe that we can get into, have yeah. um, either willingly or unwillingly um, not narrated that story of Ottoman yeah. power. Yeah, yeah. If we could just go to your final scene now, scene three, which is um, a long, a long way away from Germany. We're going to have to get in a boat and sail across the entire Atlantic Ocean where we're on the coast of Mexico, I believe. That's right. That's right. So in February 1517 now, the Spanish are in Cuba and the first landing of uh, European powers in Mexico, mainland North America, happens in this month of 1517. Hernandez de Cordoba leaves Cuba in this, in this month. Um, it takes him a couple weeks. There's a storm, but they eventually reach um, the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, the reason that I'm interested in this seemingly um, disconnected uh, uh, story vis-a-vis -vis the Ottomans is that as they are approaching the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, they see off in the distance a huge Mayan city. And um, in the account of, of this voyage, it said, uh, from the ships, we could see a large town, which appeared to lie six miles back from the coast. And as we had never seen one as large in Cuba or Hispaniola, we named the city the Great Cairo. So this is very striking to me that um, in Mexico, on the other side of the world, as you say, these Spanish conquistadors decide to name a Mayan city after Cairo. Do you think they Cairo. had been to Cairo themselves, or is that just something in their imagination that's enormous? No, and... no, no. For me, the reason that they name it Cairo is that it is symbolic. Cairo is symbolic of a foreboding enemy power, that um, this is a city that uh, had monopolized trade routes to the east for them, from which emanated ships that might have conquered um, Spanish colonial holdings in the Mediterranean, that Cairo is foreboding, dangerous, enemy, etc. So when they see a new enemy location, one that they have never seen before, populated by people that they know nothing about, they fall back on their knowledge of enemy, other, etc. from the old world. And that has to do with Islam, the Mamluks, the Ottomans, etc. And that's that's part of the reason that they name the city Cairo. And this is this is emblematic of a much larger phenomenon in the New World that Spanish conquistadors often describe indigenous locations, people's dress using the language of Islam, which is very, very striking. I can give several examples of that. So Cortez, for example, again in Mexico, a few years after 1517, writes that he sees 400 mosques in Mexico, mesquitas, most likely Aztec temples or uh, other structures. He describes indigenous women as Moorish women, Muslim women. He calls Montezuma a sultan, wow. all of this. So for me to understand this use of the language of Islam in a place where Islam does not exist in any actual way, we have to understand what formed these conquistadors in the old world, and that is the, their experiences of the encounter between Christendom and Islam. So someone like Cortes had fought against Muslims in Spain and in North Africa. So in his mind, you know, the primary figure, yeah, the primary figure of an enemy is a Muslim soldier. And so when he's encountering, you know, these new enemies, he's again falling back on That's what That's very telling, best. isn't it? And interestingly, it's very telling. And it's, it's interesting in Cortes's case that... Um, he actually comes back from Mexico and fights the last battle of his life against Muslims in Algiers in the 1540s. So again, we have someone who begins his life fighting Muslim soldiers, goes to the New World, fights indigenous um, peoples, and then comes back and fights against Muslim soldiers again. So this kind of back and forth understanding of, of how to interpret um, an enemy combatant is, is something that I think is formed in this crucible of Islam yeah, in the Old World. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. And... Yeah, very thought-provoking. Columbus had similar experiences, didn't he, Christopher Columbus, sort of personal experiences of, I mean, I think you mentioned that he was in Spain in 1492 when um, Ferdinand and Isabella mm -hmm. captured Granada mm -hmm. and expelled all Jews and Muslims. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, of course, you know, again, as we mentioned at the beginning, 1492 is one of these, you know, paradigmatic years in world history. 
The example of Cortes and of the city of Great Cairo is part of this longer history that begins with Columbus. And, and Columbus, again, if we go back to the sources, on the very first page of his journal of the Atlantic voyages, he says in January 1492, after you, my sovereigns, Isabella and Ferdinand had conquered Granada and kicked out the last uh, Muslim kingdom of Spain, then you decided to send me west to try to find the Grand Khan of mm -hmm. India, where Columbus believes he's going to the east, obviously, to find the Grand Khan of India and affect his conversion. And where does so, that, can you just explain that, um, yeah. that whole myth? Yeah. Yeah, from. so the great the, this idea of the great Khan is is a much older one that comes from the medieval period. So Marco Polo speaks about the the Grand Khan. This is the notion that that way off in China, Central Asia, India, a, a vague East, there is a sovereign who is interested in Christianity, may in fact himself convert and bring along all of his subjects to Christianity. And therefore, Christians in Europe and now Christians in the East will be surrounding the Muslim world. And they can, in one apocalyptic pincer <laughs> move, destroy Islam, reclaim Jerusalem. And, you know, it sounds like quite the a, world will be... a desperate hope, though, because presumably this Khan, I mean, he, he, if Marco Polo met him 200 years before, then Christopher Columbus is relying on the fact that his descendants are going to still be interested in converting to Christianity. Absolutely. This is this is this is mythology. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think, you know, we often think of Columbus or we're, you know, children are taught that Columbus was discovering a new world, that he was a rational economic actor, that he was scientific, for example, um, that he, you know, led all these great advances in cartography. There are some aspects of that that have some kernels of truth, but but he was also, um, you know, leading a crusade against Islam, yeah. right? That's how he saw his voyages. Again, if we go back to the journal and, and the language and, and, and the kind of world that produced him, he believes in this mythology of the East, um, of finding gold in these mythic locations that will help him to fund an army. He's very much steeped in, in this kind of mythology of the old world. He believes that he's going to find, you know, men with dog heads and... Um, people who have faces in their chests and all of yeah. this. And this is, you know, he's 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 produced of his age. I don't want to, you know, single him out. No, of course, out. that's what yeah. he'd read. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think, so, you know, there's this whole idea, this myth that they're going to find that this uh, great leader who they can convert. But was, do you think at that point, it was also the sort of, was this too early for that idea of missionary and sort of saving souls and gathering as many souls as possible onto the Christian side of the cause as opposed to the Muslim side? Or, or do you think that's that hasn't come in yet? Is that a later development? No, I mean, conver conversion is, is absolutely a part of this story. Um, it's very different than a kind of 19th century version of conversion. Um, it's, it's more about... Um, either convert or die, right? Um, and, and this is something that is shared between um, many religions, um, Islam and Christianity in this case. Um, so we see this in, in West Africa, uh, early Portuguese and, and, and Spanish slave raids that bring slaves to Iberia. These people are, are forcibly converted to Christianity. That didn't happen so much in the Muslim world, though, did it? I thought that generally, if you were conquered by a Muslim leader, they were quite pragmatic and they so were you, right. You can so, carry so on. in comparison, in comparison, ap that is absolutely the case. So, if we look at you know non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire or throughout the Muslim world versus non-Christians in the Christian world, um, non-Muslims in the Muslim world have a, a far more time, rights. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, these are very broad brushstrokes, and I don't want to you know paint anything with too um, no, no, too, of course. too rosy a picture, but. But yeah. in, in very general senses, yes. But there was slavery in the autumn world. So the concubines, for example, um, that are captured, you know, Salim's mother, um, yeah. they are converted to Islam. Right. And uh, soldiers, the Janissaries, are populated by Christian boys that are captured, converted to Islam. Um, yeah. But, but, but th there's a very important difference here in that in the Ottoman world, as odd as it sounds to us, slavery was actually a means of upward mobility, that the janissaries become the elite of society. 
Um, yeah. Slavery is not necessarily hereditary. It's not the American South. Slavery no, no. in the Ottoman Empire is not for agricultural labor. Um, it, no. it, it has a very different purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I've got one last question that, that I have to ask you, which is if you could pick up an item from one of these scenes and uh, smuggle it back to the present with you, um, what would it be? Right. So I think it would be this quite famous map that still exists, um, or at least part of it still exists. In 1517, um, after Selim has conquered Cairo, in the spring of that year, he's in Cairo dealing with various aspects of having conquered this vast amount of territory, taxation, appointing governors, etc. And someone enters into his presence uh, with a map. And we have a description, a written description of this map and of this encounter. Now, there's a lot of mythology here as well. Uh, some aspects of this story are apocryphal, but, but the map um, clearly exists because we still have a portion of it. And we're told that this was a world map, a map of the entire known world, including portions of the Atlantic and the Americas. And uh, the person who put this map together is named Piri Rais. And he says that he put this map together using maps of India and China Italian maps, and then also, quite interestingly, um, maps from Columbus's voyages. And how did he get those maps? The story goes, during an Ottoman raid on the coast of Spain, they captured several Spanish sailors, and, with, and one of these Spanish sailors had sailed with Columbus and had in his possession uh, these maps. And they eventually made their way into Pierre's hands. So he, he creates this world map, the most complete world map up until that point, from the Americas to China. Wow. When Salim sees this, he's very impressed. Um, he talks about how beautiful this map is, the colors. He looks at, you know, the this is probably the first time that he's ever seen the Caribbean um, and the Americas. And then we're told, and this is where the kind of mythology comes in, that Salim tore the map in half, gave back to Piri the Western portion, so the map of the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and then put the Eastern portion in his pocket and leaves, uh, leaves for the evening. Mm, why? So, right. So the interpretation that, that I offer is that at this point in 1517, Selim has just conquered the Mamluk Empire. He now possesses territory on the three continents of the Old World, He's at the height of his power. The Ottomans are one of the world's, you know, most um, significant powers in this in this moment. And he doesn't need to think about this treacherous, perhaps imaginary, unknown, risky place that we would call the Atlantic. The new He's world. most interested in concentrating his efforts on places of known resources, of known fortune, of known trade routes, of known yeah. goods, of known political powers, the East. So And do you think he 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 also had a sense of foreboding that the European powers had begun to uh, conquer, you know, these new unknown lands? Do you think that that w would have made him feel in some way threatened, not threatened maybe, but you know, would he have got a feeling of dread, do you think, when he found that yeah, out? Yeah, quite, quite possibly, quite possibly. Why enter into this competitive new space with all of these, uh, with, with, with the European powers who clearly have a head start? Mm. Also, he must have been tired after, you know, conquering. <laughs> it had been quite a, quite a few right, years, right. wasn't it, for him? It's interesting. So, so just to be clear, the, the, the portion of the map that we still possess is this Atlantic portion, is the Western portion. Right. And, and scholars have paid a lot of attention to this map. Um, it's one of the earliest uh, depictions of the Atlantic and of South America. What's it called? It's called the Piri Rais map. Uh, but in 1517, as you say, just after conquering the Mamluk Empire, he's really very well positioned to be uh, a global power and, uh, and doesn't want to risk anything like an Atlantic um, venture. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. And um, I think your book is, is, is a fascinating read. So thank you. Thank you. 
I just thought, thought it was a, a beautiful book, beautifully written um, and, and just full of so many interesting insights. So thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. That was Violet Moller talking to the historian Alan McHale about his new book, God's Shadow, the Ottoman Sultan who shaped the modern world. It's out just now in hardback from Faber here in the UK and from WW Norton in the USA. It's a beautifully produced, hugely provoking new take on history. Do check it out. For more about the scenes, characters and subjects featured in this episode of Travels Through Time, please do head to our website, tttpodcast.com. There you can also see our whole chronology of time travels, which is filling up really nicely. Alan's visit to 1517 fits in between Thomas Penn's journey to 1483 and the Princes in the Tower and Dermot McCulloch's trip to see Thomas Cromwell in 1536. Both of those are really worth listening to as well. We'll be back with another adventure into the past next Tuesday. But from us for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.